Uh, so we're ahead of lunch, so I want to make this interesting and punchy. And so I figured the first thing we should do is set some context. Tell us what EF really is. How does it work? And, uh, as an entrepreneur, what might I get out of it if I join? Sure. So Entrepreneur First is, uh, we call ourselves a talent investor. It's a new kind of venture capital, which starts from a very different premise than normal venture capital. Our starting point is that the world is missing out on some of its best founders. And what we mean by that is that, you know, we're sitting today right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Starting a company feels like the most natural, obvious thing in the world. But for most of the world, that's not true. In most of the world, actually, the barriers to starting a company are, are pretty large. Uh, sometimes they're cultural, sometimes they're financial, but sometimes it's just as simple as who would I start this company with and what would I work on? So what Entrepreneur First does that's very different is we don't invest in companies. We invest in people before they have a company. We identify people who we think will be great founders and we literally pay them to figure out whether they should be a founder. How much? How much do we pay them? It varies around the world, but um, we basically try and index it to like what a PhD student would, would get from their university. Oh, so it's like slave labor levels of payments. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm married to a PhD student, so I, I do <laughs> empathize, yeah. Uh, but we, the way it works is we, we pay them a small amount of money for three months, and it's meant to empower people to quit their jobs or leave what they're doing now, but before they know what they're going to work on. And then we spend 100 days working with them very closely to help them find the right co-founder, refine the right idea. And then after that period's uh, done, we invest a small amount of money, usually around $100,000, uh, into their companies and then get them ready to raise seed finance for VC. Yeah, it's a beautiful model. And I think it really does get into... Um, the sort of inverse of what Silicon Valley uh, investors have done, which is basically try to uh, amortize all risk, right? You guys are in the risky area, and so you're probably getting a lot more of the right investments. And so you've made over 200 investments in, since what, 2011? That's right, yeah. Yeah, any that uh, sort of give you a good example of, you know, maybe a founder story of somebody that really just came out of nowhere. Uh, I'm curious to hear you know, a personalized story. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a really nice story, partly because it ends here in, in Silicon Valley, is a story about these two guys who joined us in, in 2014. Um, it's an interesting story because I think it explains the sort of market failure that we solve in the rest of the world that maybe doesn't exist here. So two guys, one called Rob, one called Zihan, both very technically talented. Rob had a master's degree in electrical engineering. Zihan had a PhD in medical image analysis. They both knew they sort of wanted to start companies, but they didn't have anyone in their network who they wanted to start with. And can I ask, were they already knowing each other? Or no, this is the thing. Ah, so, there we go. And, and this is why it's so interesting. They were actually at the same university. Um, in fact, it was the best technical university in Europe, Imperial College in London. So it's like the Stanford of Europe. And yet these two guys who both had deep tech backgrounds and wanted to start deep tech companies didn't know each other, even though they're at the same university. And I think this is the thing is outside Silicon Valley, starting a company is so unusual that the networks and you know, this is um, so um, your colleague already mentioned Reed Hoffman who's our, our biggest investor. You know, what Reed would say is like network density is the most important thing. But outside Silicon Valley, network density is often very low. And so one of the things that EF does is it provides sort of a concentrated density of amazing people uh, artificially in a small place. So Rob and Zihan came to EF. They met each other at EF. They didn't actually start working together until the fifth week of our program because people iterate through teams and ideas while they're with us. They ended up figuring out that there was an interesting idea at the intersection of their, um, uh, of their backgrounds, which was thinking about how you could use machine learning to compress and, uh, and transmit video uh, at much kind of lower bandwidth cost than um, if you just do it raw. Um, they called their company a very silly but memorable name, which was Magic Pony Technology. Um, That's your Pied Piper, compression technology. Well, this was the genuine problem that we had at the time. When they pitched at our demo day in March of 2015, there were tweets from investors in the audience saying, spot the spoof company, because it sounded so like Magic Piper. Uh, sorry, Pied Piper. Um, so, um, but, you know, they, they managed to raise some money in London. Um, you know, they raised one and a half million pounds, something like that. Um, and then less than 12 months later, uh, Twitter came in. They were hoping Twitter would be their first customer. And instead, Twitter offered them $150 million to buy the company. And so they sold it. Um, first customer. And um, Rob is here in um, SF working for Twitter. He's now quite a senior mm -hmm. exec there. And Zihan runs the machine learning team for Twitter in London. So. Beautiful thing. And I actually remember reading about uh, Magic Pony. Uh, you know, there's some sort of acquisition announcement and maybe TechCrunch, something like that. And I was, remember reading the title. I'm like, what a strange name. It really did stand out. And it's kind of cool to, you know, in my, in my case, basically, it's the reverse of the story. It, it started there and it's here. Right? So it's cool to get the background. Now, 
you know, you're scouring the world for this talent, and you've got these two very talented engineers in a very uh, prestigious school, so I could see how that would be good signaling. But when you're picking people from some of the regions that I know you guys are expanded to, say Singapore, Hong Kong, it could be a little bit harder to find this talent, especially, you know, if you're scouring, say, financial firms, or maybe it's an it's a emerging economy. How do you pick that tech talent out when there's so few indicators? Yeah, so this is the real key to the model. So as you say, we're in six cities around the world. So we're in London, Paris, Berlin, Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangor. And again, I go back to the idea of networks. So I think one thing about networks is it's not, that not, networks are not just great ways of kind of um, acquiring knowledge or kind of finding things out. They're also, we, we think of networks as information processing machines. And what we mean by that is one of the great things about building a, uh, we like to say entrepreneur first is a network effects venture capital fund. And what we mean by that is the single biggest source of people um, uh, that actually join our program is referrals from people who we already know. Um, but the danger of that is that can make you very blinkered. So that makes you just already look at people who are within your network. And you know, actually the next Larry Page may not be in our network. And particularly if they don't look anything like Larry Page, if as you say, if they're from a place that's kind of not connected to something that we do now. So we have sort of three main ways that we find talent. And last year we had nearly 10,000 applications to our programs worldwide. So it's a relatively large scale. So one is referrals, as I mentioned. Um, one is, uh, is sort of cold inbound. So people read about Magic Pony and TechCrunch or whatever and they apply. The third, which I think is our secret source and is pretty interesting, is um, we actually have a team of nearly 30 people full-time globally talents searching. That's both online and offline. And so, you know, these talent scouts, uh, what they do for us is they make relationships with universities. They make relationships with local startup communities. Um, they attend conferences. They attend hackathons. They attend meetups. And, and their job is to broaden the network as far as possible. So actually about 30% of the people that join us, we've kind of cold sourced through that talent scout network. Sure. So let's say we have a conference right here, just theoretically speaking. Um, if we were a high tech founder and wanted to, you know, send you some signal, hey, we're pretty competent, we're working on something real. What might I do as a high tech founder to, you know, show competence before I say I have enough money to build the, you know, PhD rich team that I would need to actually create the technology? Yeah, so one of the challenging things about our model in a way is a normal venture capitalist obviously screens on the idea on the way in. So, you know, you, you come to me and I'd be like, well, Michael, what's your idea? And you would tell me and I would, you know. I have You're like, do you have any others? <laughs> right, right, exactly, yeah. Uh, but I'd have a framework for evaluating it. We don't get to do that because when people join us, one of the things we deliberately don't do is filter on the idea because we think that sometimes great people have bad ideas. <laughs> so what we do instead is we say, what is your personal competitive advantage that could become the basis of a future idea? And we call that your edge. Yep. Um, and so the thing that we would be looking for to um, impress us is what is the evidence of that edge? Mm -hmm. And it can be anything. It doesn't have to be a startup. It can be what have you done that shows us that you genuinely have that personal competitive advantage, whether it's something that you've done. You know, in some cases, the people that join us are very academic, so maybe something they've done in that context. In other cases, they're not academic at all. They've dropped out of college or never been. Yeah. And so it's something they've done outside. But it's really like one of the things that entrepreneurs obviously need to have is like very high levels of agency. Mm -hmm. They need to be people that just get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And so we're constantly probing for evidence of like, what have you done that's outside the norm? Mm -hmm. What have you done that your peers haven't done? Um, we're pretty open-minded about what that looks like, mm -hmm. but um, we do want to see that there's, there's something that people have just got up and done that sh demonstrates that edge. It's, it's kind of like a creative expression. Now, You'll find some of these people, maybe they do a fairly high agency, but maybe they are coming from a research background where the incentive systems haven't really made them so good at anything but publishing and getting you know, citations. So what do you find a lot of the tech founders, maybe even some of the audience, would need to sort of sharpen their edge on, you know, generally speaking, um, if they want to actually become a good founder from right now being a good technologist? Yeah, so we often... When we talk to founders about this, one of the things that we often say is, you know, there is no way that you can um, sort of learn to be a founder by reading a book or, you know, watching a video. In fact, you, you, you only... definitely can from going to a conference. You definitely can from going to the conference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you, you just have to get going. And so, like, one of the things that we most emphasize at EF is speed. So um, the people that join us, they have 12 weeks to kind of form form their team that we decide whether or not to invest in. And so... What we often say is it's all about like what is the length of the cycle over which they're iterating. If it takes them four weeks to test an idea, mm -hmm. then they get three shots in 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. If it takes them one week, 
they get 12 shots. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take them half a week, they get 24 shots, etc. And so what our, our advice is there is no substitute for just getting out and going to do it mm -hmm. and then setting yourself a really rigorous, um, really strict um, evaluation points. Which after three days, I'm going to like cold, hard look at whether or not we've actually got anything done. Um, and so one of the things that we provide to support is um, in-house, full-time advisors who work with the companies and are able to calibrate a little bit what good looks like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, actually this isn't that fast or, you know, of the teams that we fund, we see most of them move a lot quicker than this is the sort of thing that we would say, mm -hmm. as well as providing gen uh, kind of general advice on how to get started. Cool. So what I'm hearing is you guys created sort of a, um, I like to say, collision, high collision environment. Exactly. Um, you guys have the advisory relationships to get people a little actual honest feedback. Um, you've got uh, maybe some frameworks that they can use to you know, guess, test, and revise their model. But not a lot of people here are actually going to get into EF, unfortunately, right? It's, gonna, it's a pretty competitive application pool. So how can some of the folks in the audience here who might have high-tech startups bring some of the things that you've learned into their business without necessarily yeah, moving to London or Berlin, but uh, doing it tomorrow? So I think one of the things that um, we provide, which is very simple and actually very easy to replicate outside EF, is just accountability. So I think one of the most important things that um, uh, any founder needs is they need some way of holding themselves to account for, for speed. Um, and so, you know, at EF, that means checking in with one of our team every week and, you know, very basic, did you do what you said you were going to do? And that's not because, like, we're their boss. It's just because having that, like, third party who can say, how's it going? How's it really going? Mm -hmm. Did you actually do that? Um, I think that's a very powerful forcing mechanism. And for most people, I think that, that actually helps them move faster. You can replicate that very easily outside a program by having either a friend or a colleague or a mentor who, who will hold you to account and just say, yeah, hopefully as regularly as possible. So every week, did you actually do that thing? <laughs> how, how fast is it going? You know, I always say like, I can tell when a company's going to go well when they have positive surprises. Yeah. You know, so when it's like, did you do that thing that you said you were going to do? Yeah, I did that, and I also did this. That's usually a very good sign. Beautiful. We have our activity for after this, find an accountability buddy. Um, so that's an excellent piece of advice. Do you have any others? So I think, you know, I mean, a lot of the things that we said to our stops, I, I think, are kind of fairly well known. Um, but you know, I, th I think particularly in one of the dangers in deep tech is that um, you fall in love with the technology. And you know, I would say eighty percent of our portfolio has you know some sort of like deep tech orientation. And by deep tech, what we mean is that um, the right to exist, the right to win for that startup, comes from the differentiation of their technology. Um, I think the danger of that is that it makes you. Uh, yeah, it, it can make you obsess over the technology rather than the customer. In fact, funnily enough, the reason that Magic Pony technology was called Magic Pony technology is that I used to give a talk at the start of every cohort with the title, Don't Build a Magic Pony. And they kind of ruined that for me, and I can't give that anymore. But um, the reason it was called that was, um, my, my point was, you could labor for a year building a magic pony, um, but if no one wants a magic pony, then actually, you know, you, you just wasted a year of your life. And you're kind of pretending that you can build this thing that's going to be so magical that everyone will want it, and so there's no need to talk to your customers is a really dangerous mistake. So, like, testing early with customers, even before you've built the technology, yeah. I think is very important. That definitely resonates. So, uh, those are really strong pieces of actionable advice you can take home and get started on tomorrow. But uh, going deeper into that uh, attachment to technology, I think you know we were just coming out of the hype cycle around blockchain. Now we're entering another hype cycle around machine learning. And I think a lot of folks might become attached to that being the solution. So through doing these things, sort of incubating these founders, maybe who did come in with a certain technical competency, what are you finding out about particular technical trends that surprises you? Yes, I think one of the most important things we've learned is that we are not smarter than the founders. Um, now, I say learn, I think we start with that, with that premise. And what I mean by that is, I think it's very hard for anyone uh, who's not close to the technology to sit in a room and say, what's gonna be big? And to be right with any degree of reliability. So again, going back to the idea of networks, one of the things that we do, instead of saying, we think machine learning is going to be big, let's go out and find people who are good at machine learning. Um, and we've been investing, by the way, for a long time in machine learning since you know, before it was popular. Uh, uh, you know, the hipster machine learning investors. Um, what we did instead, when we started investing in, in that space back in sort of 2013, was we were just spending a lot of time on university campuses and literally just saying to people, who's the smartest person here? And what are they interested in? 
And I think actually by going to sort of like the edge of a network and seeing what, what people are interested in there, that's where you identify the next big thing rather than by trying to reason from first principles. So, you know, I mean, what my belief is, you know, there's, there's a lot of hype. Um, oh, no, it's back. Um, there's a lot of hype around machine learning, um, but I actually think rightly so. And um, although... Um, there probably is some of that that is um, all smoke and mirrors. I think you know we are now starting to see companies using machine learning in very profound ways in the enterprise at scale, making money. And I think that is you know we're at the very start of that rewriting huge chunks of the economy. Uh, I would say so. We, we we're still very excited about that. And and I would say almost like the things that we see our founders get most excited about are less sort of totally new types of technology and more where things like machine learning are intersecting with other fields which may be outside traditional computer science. So machine learning meets biology, machine learning meets materials, machine learning meets um, energy. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do think that machine learning is, is the fundamental technology that will drive uh, a lot of change over the next, say, decade. But I think it's about to be applied with huge impact to, um, to a lot of fields outside computer science. Yeah, and so those are some interesting lessons from taking away from the edge of technology. I'm actually curious about what you're learning from the edge of geography. Uh, you guys are pretty much a huge recognized name in Europe and Asia especially, but here in Silicon Valley, you're, you know, you're competing with the Kleiner Perkins and what have you. Um, and I wonder, what is it about Silicon Valley that maybe makes it less attractive as uh, an approach in terms of talent investing? Yeah, so I think... If you think about like, what is the essence of the value that entrepreneur first creates, it's really about um, changing what people do with their lives. So a lot of the value that, that we create is saying to people who otherwise might not become founders at all, look at the potential that you might have if you were to start a tech company from scratch. And then systematically providing the resources that makes that possible, whether that's most importantly finding a co-founder or refining an idea at the very early stage or getting that little bit of capital. You know, when I look at Silicon Valley, I don't see those as being like the scarcities. You know, like if I was to walk up and down University Avenue in Palo Alto and say, have you ever thought about starting a technology company? People would laugh in my you face. Um, whereas actually, you know, even in London, which of the six cities we're in probably has the most developed technology ecosystem, it's still pretty weird to start a company. People want to be bankers. People want to be lawyers. And actually, I, you know, like one of my like deepest beliefs and one of the reasons I start this company is I think it really matters what the most ambitious people do with their lives. Um, if the most ambitious people want to become bankers, you're going to end up with an economy that's dominated by finance. If the most ambitious people want to build technology that changes the world, then you're going to have, I think, a much more exciting and vibrant economy and society. And so for us, the reason, you know, in a way, the, the, that thesis has already won in Silicon Valley, and now we're just trying to make that win everywhere else in the world. So really distributing philosophy. I love that. So we're going to throw it over to some questions. We're going to take a handful of them, and you'll notice that cube flying around. So if you've got something in mind, throw your hand up in the air. And uh, yeah, we got one sort of in the back there. Cool. You can just talk right into the cube. Oh, oh. That's crazy, huh? Look at that. that. Um, I had a question about how do you reconcile speed with the fact that you said deep tech is fundamentally about making the technology work. So how do you iterate on your product really fast while also trying to make the technology work and be differentiated because that's going to determine your success? So it's a great question. When, when I'm talking about iteration, I'm really talking about finding the right use case, finding the right customer, and making sure it's genuinely valuable. So the risk that I see um, in deep tech companies is that you have a great technology that is like trying to force fit into a problem, you know, solution in search for a problem, as the, as, as the phrase goes. So when I talk about iterating fast, what I'm really talking about is before you spend a year closed up in a room, you know, with 12 other really smart people building something, make sure you're actually building the thing that, you know, that, that, that creates value for the, for the customer. And that I think you can iterate very quickly. Uh, so I, what I'm really talking about is, you know, delaying the deep tech development until you're very, very sure that what you're building really matters. We got another one back there. Yep. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, there, I, I believe there's a. It's called. It's TechStars, uh, based out of. I think they started out of Silicon Valley. They're using personality and intelligence testing tool to identify the entrepreneurs. So it's a similar concept. Uh, is that what you're doing? Like, how are you identifying who to select? Is it 
you know, extroversion, um, openness? So at the moment we don't, it's a good question, we, at the moment we don't use any psychometric testing uh, and we don't do IQ testing. Um, it's something we've looked at periodically, but you know, I think one of the interesting things about entrepreneurship and particularly about venture capital as a business model is that you're really looking for outliers. Outliers are where you make your money. Um, and so the danger for me of, of doing something where you're saying, here's a test and it can identify who's a good founder is that you know, the false negatives matter a lot more than the false positives. It don't, you know, we can invest in a lot of things that go wrong, but if we miss the thing that could be really big, then that's very bad. So we much prefer to spend time with people and, you know, do a structured interview and really, like, probe uh, on the competencies that we've seen in our best founders. Um, over time, we may, you know, reintroduce and, and look at whether there's some way of testing that, that helps us. But I think it is, at the moment, we believe it's very important for us to just spend one-on-one -on -one time with people and get to know them. is kind of the the other side of that um, you mentioned earlier you know most people will have some kind of solution now they're looking for a problem but what if you have multiple problems that can be addressed by one solution um, but the it, you know it creates a more complicated solution and something that hasn't really been done because you're putting together a number of different types of solutions how would you go about being able to pitch that or present that so that it makes more sense to an investor? So I think, I think I would still start with whatever you perceive to be the most valuable and important problem within that. And I would really hone the fit between that problem and the solution that you have in mind. And then I would, what I would probably do is pitch that as the idea and then say, and guess what? There are these other adjacencies that we could go into later that we'd be really well equipped for. But in general, I think you're a lot better. You know, focus is one of the most important tools in a founder's toolkit. And so I think in general, it's much better to sort of start with one thing, get really, really good at that. You know, most problems end up being more nuanced than they look at the start. And so even if you do have a solution that can solve multiple problems, I think it's usually better to focus and then, you know, if necessary, later expand. What do you think is the best way to target the small uh, businesses? Like how to make your product reach them, basically. How to, as a startup, sell to small businesses. Yeah, exactly, and make sure that every like small business knows about your product. Um, the first thing I'd say is it's really, really hard. Um, uh, targeting small businesses is really, really tough for a number of reasons. Uh, one, there's a lot of them. It's very fragmented. There's no one place that you know you can, they all hang out. Two depending on how small, they're often run in, in ways that are quite counterintuitive and their incentives are not always what you think they are. Um, I think my genuine advice would be, I would think really hard before building a startup where small business was the main customer base. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible, but it's, it's pretty challenging. Um, and you know, I, I think to the extent that it is the right thing, that would suggest that you would have to have figured out the go-to-market for that uh, in advance. I think it's pretty hard to say, and I've seen many stops fail to do this, it will be easier to sell to small business, and therefore that's what we're going to do, and we'll figure out the go-to-market. Often, actually, it's the figuring out to go-to-market that kills the startup. So I, I, think it, I think it is pretty tough. Um, and the one exception would be if by small business we mean other startups. So I think sometimes you can build great businesses at least to begin with, by selling to other startups. And that's where being in a network of startups is really valuable. So, um, but in general, I think for a startup, small businesses are pretty tough uh, not to crack. So like uh, specific marketing campaigns and stuff. So it's like nearly impossible basically. To Sorry, can you repeat that? So with like specific marketing campaigns and stuff, it's nearly impossible to target the right audience? Well, I, it really depends on the specifics of the product. I mean, clearly there are companies that, have, that do successfully attract small businesses. I think they're a very difficult first customer because the channels tend to be very fragmented. Mm -hmm. So it's better to like target more maybe mid-sized businesses first or larger companies and then go to small scale. Again, it really depends on the business. I can think of some businesses that have managed to do that. You know, like um, TransferWise, the founder of TransferWise is an investor of ours. Um, you know, if you look at what they did, you know, they had a very specific need that a lot of small businesses had, and they had a very specific plan for like how small businesses might go about solving that need and like figuring out how to place themselves in those channels. But I think for other businesses, um, it, it is very challenging. 
Yeah, and so sort of speaking as a marketer, um, when you think about small businesses, am I talking about brick and mortars? Am I talking about B2B software? Am I talking about B2C software? Am I talking about uh, e-commerce? It's always going to differ, and I think the critical component is look at competitors in the space and see how they're doing it. A lot of webinars and freemium models good in the software space. In the B2B space, you might be doing more door-to-door -door and even events to get to sort of the first few warm intros. If you're doing brick and mortar too, then that might be more door-to-door -door or paid ads. But uh, either way, I think you want to find yourself in a space where you can both create value for them, but also capture it. And a lot of these small businesses don't, just don't have enough value put through that you can capture too much of the revenue from them. We'll do one more over here. Yeah, um, so I see um, startup founders um, kind of in three different levels. Um, some of them are like people that are like rich, they already have some some money, some sort of status and connections and so on. They start a company, they started the SpaceX's and the Palantirs and things like that. And there's people that like younger people that go through accelerators that can live in like stipends and have different barriers for, for starting a company. And there's quite a big segment that is in between, right? I remember three years ago actually getting an offer to get a, uh, to starting an entrepreneur first. Um, and uh, I, I, I couldn't because of the kind of my, my situation. And there's a, I found that there's quite a, quite a bit of people that are in that in between. And they're very talented people uh, that just cannot make that jump. Is that something that uh, accelerators like Entrepreneur First should solve? Or do you think it's more the responsibility on the other side or it's a different problem? I think it's all a question of like, how do you share the risk? So you Hello? Okay. Uh, EF this year will pay out probably something in the region of like three or four million dollars in stipends to founders where we may or may not ever see any return for that. And it's worth it for us and our investors are happy for us to do that because when it works, then it really works. You know, like you get a magic pony, you pay it off many times. The, the challenge is, you know, if we had to double that amount to make it doable for, say, people whose personal burn rate is much higher, suddenly the math starts to be quite complicated. You know, or rather, it suddenly starts to not make sense to give away that money, um, or at least it's hard for me to convince our investors that we should. It's something we look at all the time because you know, like our big mantra is the world is missing out on some of its best founders. So we're constantly interested in like, where does the market fail to provide uh, access? And, and, and the example you're talking about is a very real one. So one of the things we're looking at right now is if there are ways to split the risk in ways that are manageable for, for people, maybe some sort of like um, income sharing agreements for downside uh, mitigation um, when it doesn't work. Um, and so yeah, it's something we're actively exploring, but it is very tough just because the economics of startups are very tough. Um, and, and so you know, I think both founders and investors need to figure out, um, is, there a, is there upside in, um, in bringing even more of the, um, uh, the risk forward onto investors? So here's what I've learned. Uh, if you want to build an emerging tech startup and bring it to market, you don't want to get attached to your technology or idea. Don't make it a magic pony uh, unless you're selling to Twitter. Um, definitely find yourself testing that idea early and often. And finally, find yourself an accountability buddy, maybe in this room. And as we enter our next spot, we're about to head into break. Um, go ahead, look around, make a friend, and maybe find someone who can hold you accountable to delivering week by week. And so with that, Matt, thank you so much for being here. Give him a hand.